Hi, hello and welcome. It's me, Nella Fahadayat, and you are streaming Dear World Live. Education, I would like to argue, plays a hugely important role in leveling the playing field. How do we actually ensure women's inclusion? How do we ensure women's safety? Hello, hi, and welcome. Yes, it's me, Nelifa Hidayat, with another series of Dear World Live from Doha Debates. This season, we're talking about the climate crisis. Over the next few weeks leading up to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference will be carving out time and space for activists, leaders, and policymakers to come together and discuss their concerns and their bright ideas for combating the climate crisis we all find ourselves in. COP26 is a hugely important climate conference where vital conversations about global climate policy will take place. Whether those conversations turn into real action, well, that's a different matter. Now, just two weeks ago, I was at the United Nations Youth for Climate Summit in Milan, Italy, where I got to meet young climate activists and talk to them about the climate crisis and really listen and hear about their ideas about what we can and what we absolutely must be doing. I hope to carry many of those ideas into Dear World Live this season. So with that said, today we're talking about the climate and food, what we eat, how we produce it and the impact that it has on climate change. But first, I want to set the scene, as it were, in terms of what the stakes really are and what is going on. 35% of all the greenhouse gas emissions made by human beings comes from producing food for the world's 7.9 billion people. That's according to a recent scientific study. Now, when I say food production, I mean things like industrial food factories, farming, food storage, transport, and consumption. All in all, food production generates 17.3 billion metric tons of greenhouse gases every year. Now, to put that into perspective, that's almost 19 times the amount released by trips on planes every year. What's more, producing the meat that we eat causes twice the pollution as plant-based foods. And that's not all. As our food productions exacerbate the climate crisis, climate change is making food production harder. Changes in temperature, rainfall, and other weather patterns are leading to more droughts, floods, and famine. A recent study earlier this year found that by the end of the century, a third of global food production will be at risk if we do nothing about this. So, before we meet today's guests, let's hear from someone who has been personally affected by climate change and food shortages. Hi, I'm a Nigerian farmer and Nigeria, like every other African country, depends primarily on rain-fed agriculture and usually we are able to predict our farming seasons. But unfortunately, situation of things have changed, most especially with the issue of pandemic last year. The underlying issues um, around climate crisis was more apparent. So a farmer friend like Atoda struggled really hard to feed his family last year. And this was because of crop failure. So Atoda had thought that it was business as usual. So to address the challenge faced by Atoda and so many other farmers out there, it is important for us to take actions to ensure ensure that we have sustainable food systems, which is also equitable. So four things actually that I would be suggesting. The first is stepping down solutions that are stemming out from technology um, to people that need them at the grassroots. Second is in the aspect of looking inwards and backwards to see what works for us. And the third is considering integrated farming. And since no one is an island, we should really be considering group farming.
So that was Fisoya Oyewale, a Nigerian farmer who co-founded an agribusiness that economically empowers farmers, setting out the scene and the stakes of what is at risk. As ever, Dear World Live, this stream is nothing without you and your input. When you have a comment, when you have a thought, when you have a question, drop it down into the chat function wherever you are watching this stream. Uh, we are at Doha Debates across all our social media and we will put your comments and your questions to our guests. You can be part of the show. That's the beauty of Dear World Life. For now though, just tell me where you are in the world uh, and who you are and if you face any concerns about the food that you eat with relation to climate change. Okay, without any further ado, let us meet today's guests. Lana Weidgenant is a climate activist focusing on food systems. She held a youth leadership role at the recent United Nations Food Systems Summit this year. And she is also Deputy Director for Zero Hour, an international climate justice organization. Emma Piercy is the Food and Drink Federation's uh, voice in the UK, uh, the, the UK food and drink industry's main voice. She's the head of climate change and energy policy and leads the work on transitioning the sector to net zero emissions. As ever, we're joined by a wonderful student and audience, and audience member. member. This week, we're joined by Mohamed Alif Naufal. Uh, you are from Indonesia, I believe, and currently studying in Qatar. He will be serving as the president of the General Assembly for the Model United Nations in Qatar in 2020. Thank you all for joining me, my wonderful guest. Let's kick things off right away, Lana. You're a climate activist, but you really focus on food and food systems. When did you realize that the two are definitely linked and, and to solve one, we need to look at the other? The aspect that really made me realize that was the industrial agriculture that you were discussing, or for me specifically factory farming, which is more of the industrial livestock agriculture. That really opened my eyes when I started learning more about the massive amount of emissions that come out of that and then how that also ends up harming the surrounding communities, uh, brings out a lot of pollution and is uh, terrible in terms of the food production, in terms of the health of the food that people are consuming um, and how that is really connected. That brought the uh, dots to connect for me. And that's where I first saw um, how this is so clearly um, all connected and connected to a bunch of other issues as well, such as environmental justice and human rights. But where were you amongst this? I mean, you're talking about huge issues, right? Factory farms. It's even sometimes hard. I've been to them in California. You can't even see the edges of them. They're so vast. And then you're talking about food systems and the climate change. What did you feel as a person and why did you feel like you wanted to get involved? What was that emotion that brought you to that place of, of wanting to make change? Part of that for me is uh, being part of the younger generation uh, right now. So climate change really feels like a direct threat to young people, um, especially the youngest uh, people in the world right now. And uh, part of that was also realizing that we all can take a place in this climate movement and do something. You don't have to be a specific kind of person uh, to stand up and say that we need to fight the climate crisis in any way that we can. And part of that is food systems. Now, you recently attended the United Nations Food Systems Summit, um, and there you were speaking directly to, and there you are, lovely picture of you at the, at the summit, you were speaking directly to leaders. Were they listening to you and other activists, Lana? I think it's important to say that this was the first time we really had young people as vice chairs of a UN Food Systems Summit really integrated into the process like that. That being said, just because the process brought us in and put us in into the decision making rooms doesn't mean that the leaders were necessarily listening. I think there was a lack of uh, the representatives that were there showing up to the youth session and really listening to the youth voices. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. A realist as ever, Lana. Emma, I'd like to come to you next. You work at the Food and Drink Federation here in the United Kingdom. In fact, you're in London, a couple of roads <laughs> down from where I'm in the studio. Why did you decide to take the role on? Why was this role even needed? What problem was the Food and Drink Federation looking to solve? Well, to be honest, this is not a new problem. Um, th this role, um, I actually took over for my predecessor who had been at FDF for, I think, about 20 years. 
Uh, but so the role itself in climate change and energy has been around for a long time. And I think, you know, that in itself uh, reflects you know, what we've seen in UK policy around uh, decarbonising uh, the electricity grid system, the role of renewables, you know, improving on energy efficiency, because these uh, have been sort of the main sort of topics um, as such, but certainly within my predecessor's role. Um, and remains remains the case as like a business as usual activity. We have something called uh, climate change agreements, uh, which um, in return for for basically meeting energy efficiency targets, you get a reduction on the climate change levy. That's been around for 20 years. Um, but now today, as I took on the role actually two, two years ago, you know, things have evolved. You know, the men momentum behind uh, sustainability, decarbonisation, net zero, that's increased massively. So I think in myself coming on board, it's actually uh, taken a, an additional perspective, which is actually uh, for me to establish, well, what are the problems that, that we need to solve? What are the priorities that we should take uh, as an organisation at FDF to help our members uh, and, and the sector uh, in their decarbonisation journeys? And uh, it's a long journey by the sounds of it, 25 yes. years before you, and here you are carrying that on. And you represent brands like Coca-Cola, Kellogg's, Johnson & Johnson, and hundreds and hundreds more. It's, it's a very powerful organization. Mm -hmm. What are you telling these companies to change in order to be climate conscious? Yes, I think that the, the first thing that any company needs to do is to be able to understand their impact on the environment. And, and I think you've got a, a slide um, that we can we can show colleagues. Okay, so mm. um, th this this slide is taken from our forthcoming uh, handbook uh, for net zero. It's, it's coming on the the ninth of November. And what this illustrates uh, is, on average, uh, the breakdown of how the the carbon footprint of the average food product is sort of made up, or it, it, in the in the UK. Um, so if you take all the products in the UK, this this is what it comes out of. Uh, and and so, as I said, what we see here is about 65% of emissions come from uh, ingredients. Uh, and you can see the, the figures for the other areas. So it's understanding where your carbon footprint is um, and then uh, to take actions uh, in each of those areas. Um, and that's something that will be sort of helping businesses with another uh, publication on the ninth. Uh, very quickly, uh, are they listening? Uh, or do you feel like you're dragging them into this new age of consciousness and, and, uh, and, and dragging them into re receiving the messages you're trying to tell them? Uh, to, to be honest, um, I, I'd actually disagree with the question in the sense of uh, I think we're seeing some great uh, progress, um, it, it, certainly with some of the, the larger companies. I mean, Nestle recently, for example, uh, did a big uh, announcement around regenerative agriculture. But a point here I think we need to make is that the larger multinationals have resource. You know, certainly in the UK, when we talk about numbers of companies, about 96% of companies are SMEs. And actually, uh, what we need to be able to do is, is to particularly help those companies that don't have the resources to to, to make progress in this area and as this well. is a perfect opportunity emma to see if your hard work is paying off if the public if just the general audience watching this stream of dear world live is hearing that message so let's bring in mohammed mohammed you're just a normal everyday student do you feel like these big organizations the food producers the transporters do you think that they're making those sorts of changes that emma spoke about how do you feel in your day-to-day -day life when you hear that um, that message well i feel like Every once and then you see that some changes are act, are actually being implemented. So, for example, uh, some products perhaps are beca becoming more eco-friendly. You know, they're becoming more recyclable and whatnot. Even shirts, clothing, they're, they're, all of these different things are slowly becoming more uh, friendly to the environment. But I do have a question for... Uh, Emma, actually, uh, actually, let me so come to you in a moment because I'm going to I'm going to come to your question in a second. I wanted to get a hot take from you and a hot take it was. But I want to thank the people who are watching this stream of Dear World Live, wherever it is that you're streaming this. This is a live show. 
I want you to be part of it. We are at Doha Debates across all of our social media channels. Wherever you're watching this, drop us a comment, drop us a question. Do you agree that in order to, sh uh, to save our climate and to avert climate catastrophe, that we need to change the way we produce and consume food? Now, Mohammed, back to you. You've got a question for um, our, uh, our guests. What do you want to say? Yeah, so I heard that Emma has been working with all of these large companies, but the question I have in mind is the food industry seeks to maximize profits, right? So how do you actually encourage or even incentivize those large companies to become more, to implement more sustainable practices when perhaps they could even compromise profits? Yes, absolutely. I think the first word that comes to mind is about well-being. And, uh, and I think when we, when we talk about moving organizations from sort of the, a traditional uh, capitalist kind of uh, neoliberal model about you know, profit maximization, it's actually then about uh, engaging them on what the future looks like, how, this, how the environment is changing in, in, which we all, in which we all live, and that to be successful in the long term, actually the priorities um, do need to, to shift and be more reflective of, you know, the, the social, economic and environmental uh, agendas. If, if, on, if, you know, if you look at your customers and, and consumers, um, if, they're, if they're also calling for this, then you need to yes. deliver that. And, and, and the environment in which you produce the items, you need to take care of the natural capital, because if you don't, it will no longer be there. So it's... Um Emma, I love the mm -hmm. fact that you are in the ear of people uh, like Coca-Cola, uh, like Kellogg's and Johnson & Johnson, telling them this, whispering them these climate conscious messages. But Lana, let me come to you as a person who has worked in Brazil and worked in other areas of the world where that decimation of the environment, where the degradation of the quality of life of the people who live there is abundant. From your personal experience, what do you think needs to change and how quickly does it need to change? Emma, doing her best to, to, to bring these messages on board to these organizations and these corporations but how desperate is the situation what have you seen in your activism i think uh, one of the first things that needs to change is just concrete action and climate change because i've seen uh, so much talk especially from the world leaders and not enough uh, concrete action. I think oftentimes what we really see is the net zero by 2050 uh, just becomes a kind of a loophole or a way to delay action and not really do anything right now. So it's just uh, strong enough that it seems like you're doing something, but you don't actually take action in the present moment. Uh, so I'd be really be interested in how Emma is making sure that it's not just greenwashing and that they are actually making changes right now. Um, well, that, exactly on that point, um, that's exactly what we intend to achieve uh, with our handbook that we published on the 9th of November. It's directly focused on actions that businesses, uh, that manufacturers can take in each of those elements of that, that carbon footprint we saw. Um, and, and, and I think the other perspective I'd, I'd like to say is that actually in the UK, uh, we have committed from farm to fork, so the, the National Farmers Union, ourselves, the British Retail Consortium, to actually uh, work towards net zero by 2040. And one of the reasons for bringing it forward to 2040 is that we that uh, encourages businesses even more to take the actions sooner now and instead of later. Okay, let's let's put the focus on Lana for a moment. You did well there, Emma. You you held your own. Lana, activism itself is is a difficult thing to do, especially when you're a young person. What surprising thing, what necessary thing can you tell young people, maybe even Mohammed right now, who is who's tuning, who's self-selecting to be here and be part of this conversation, what can you tell them in order to get involved in this in this issue? Um, and and what, what important facts do we need to consider when it comes to, or maybe facts that we don't necessarily think about when it, when it comes to food and the climate? I think uh, some of the best things to do uh, when you're looking to get involved is to at first become part of a youth organization uh, or a youth focused initiative because then you already have the connections there and you already have the existing projects. So it's something that you can directly plug into, even if you start at your local level um, or if you find a larger organization that you can become part of. And another aspect that has been helpful for me is plugging my activism into the UN. 
Um, and so directly realizing that we don't just have to ask the UN to do certain things or ask countries to do certain things, that there is an official pathway for youth voices to be heard in the United Nations and bringing our asks into that space has been extremely helpful for my activism. Good. Now, do, do Emma, to you, do you have any advice for our climate activists? Now, that sounds a bit weird asking someone from the industry, but if we are going to change things and avert a climate crisis, it means we all have to be talking to one another. And that is one thing I'm sure we can all agree we're not doing. So I will ask you directly, what advice do you give to climate activists and how could they be more effective in impacting industry not politics industry emma yes yes i i think a key thing um you know is 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 around like like with uh, consumer information you know understanding what it is that consumers need um to be able to to help them make uh should we say better choices and so f- from a, a climate activist point of view i think getting engaged uh with that debate um uh, and uh, engaging with manufacturers uh, around this, I think, will be extremely helpful. There is a lot of work at the moment looking at, at labelling uh, on products. There's there's different and the environmental uh, footprint of products, but there's lots of different methodologies. How do you communicate that with consumers? And there isn't a single answer to that. And we need are you to frustrated get by to it? That. Are are you are you frustrated by it? Um, by how? I mean, I'm going to say it again. There is a reluctance. If something makes money, people are going to go ahead and do it. Mohammed's question alluded to that. You know, just as a person who is, mm. would you say you're an activist? I mean, is that, some, is that way that you would describe yourself? Um, I, I've been in, in sort of the energy policy side of things, so in the environment for, for 20 years now. And, and I do it because I have a passion uh, in it. But I think at the same time, we have to get solutions that, that are workable and uh, that the industry can can adopt and, and that the public support. Because obviously from, from the environmental perspective, you know, we look at sustainable development, that's environmental, it's economic, it, it's social development. So we also do need to be mindful about prices. Um, so there's a lot of things to juggle. So we need practical, real solutions that developed it, it, with with all the stakeholders involved. And I think sometimes I do have a frustration uh, uh, in that regards. Mohammed, would you pay lots and lots more for food that is ethically, responsibly farmed, transported, brought, brought to, the to the store where you where buy you it buy- from? Would you pay maybe double, triple the price? Because that's what it costs to make if the lobbyists aren't involved, if there isn't subsidies. That's what those things will cost. I mean, how do you feel about it just as a, as a student, as a normal person in the world? Well, I, not everyone is privileged. So I personally, I think it's a bit difficult if prices are to double or even triple. So not everyone would be able to afford all of these, you know, perhaps organic or more uh, green um, products. And obviously there are a lot of these products even now but in shops, but not everyone are buying them because of the fact that they're, th- they're products that are more accessible. And even though they might not be more sustainable or more eco-friendly, they are cheaper. And that's what pretty much attracts most consumers. So there is this vicious cycle. There is the cycle of Lana and Emma working hard to raise our collective consciousness of what the environmental impact is of something we do at least three times a day, right? We put food in our mouths if we're privileged enough to do so. Mm -hmm. Mohammed pointing out the issues of privilege, of the ability for me to sit here with my coffee and my food. And so we've come to the real question, who do we serve? And who do we ask to hold the responsibility and accountability? So a question for you, Lana, what kind of social responsibility would you like to see at a corporate level? Um, I'd specifically like to see more accountability being taken for the current negative impacts that, for instance, the food industry and the fashion industry are having. Because oftentimes what I see as a climate activist is I see a fashion business or a food business um, introduce a new green recycled line um, that is their like eco-friendly line. But the 99% of their production is still that um, environmentally destructive production instead of scaling back on what's currently harming the environment. 
because uh, that's what they should be doing instead of introducing one, like 1% 1 of what they do is eco-friendly. Okay, before I get to a question for both uh, Lana and Emma, uh, I want to get to some of the comments and questions that have been coming in across our social media channels. We are at Doha Debates. So we've got comments in from Trisha, who's in India and got in touch on YouTube to say, uh, to say that we should continue the good work. <laughs> that's, that's nice. Thanks, Trisha. I'll do my best. Um, comments in coming in from Tom um, Schaugler, I believe, on YouTube. Is there any significant progress seen in any of these groups in reducing these emissions? Um, and then Jith from YouTube says, could you share your thoughts on ethical sources of forest produce? Uh, we'll come back to that. Ryan Rizwan from YouTube has another question. What do you think about the heavy emission released by countries whose main sector is natural gas? And finally, Hugger Bear from YouTube uh, says, what about companies that give lip service to a green policy, as Lana mentioned? So many com uh, companies say they are doing something and we have to take their word. Who is holding them accountable and how do we hold them accountable? Sorry, is, is the point. So questions coming in. You've got moments left um, to send in your comments. Are you facing the repercussions of climate change? Is it affecting the way you eat or the food being produced where you're from? Let me know if that's the case in the chat function, wherever it is that you are tuning in. So now back to you, Lana and Emma. If I can just have Lana and Emma on the screen. This is a question to the both of you. What can activists and corporations work on together? So name me things that they can work on, not things we want to achieve, but things we can work on in the coming future to make a bigger impact um, and change those emissions that I, that I talked about in terms of the food industry, uh, the amount it generates. So what can activists and corporations work on together? What should you be working on together and talking about together? You first, Emma. Okay. Um, the first thing I think is the, the environmental footprinting aspect, which I've already covered, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, and, and I think that is actually uh, understanding, for example, what does sustainable healthy diets mean? Um, you know, there are a lot of definitions and, you know, I, I think sometimes the debates can be quite polarised. Uh, you know, we see a great growth in, in vegan and plant based products. And that, that's uh, that's fantastic. You mentioned earlier in your introductory comments about uh, CO2 you know, from uh, from meat. However, of course, sustainable uh, meat is uh, and, and uh, you know, in terms of farming is really important for, for land management. So we really need to have a really practical debate uh, rather than sometimes it getting quite polarized, which is what we see on on occasions. Lana, turn down the 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 anger perhaps or turn down the 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 way that we sometimes talk in our fiery language as activists. Do you think that there's something that you could work with corporations on? Uh, definitely. I think that in the same way that in more of the political space, young people have really been for the UN Food System Summit brought into the leadership and decision making and basically brought to the table for one of the first times to really be meaningfully involved. You could do the same thing with corporations where you more directly engage with young people and hear what do we care about? What are our priorities and what do we want to see from the industry? I love it. There's some there's some homework for both of you there. Um, now, we heard at the top of the show the desperate uh, numbers that, that we mentioned, that if we are going to stop a climate catastrophe, we have to change things because that is where we are destined to go unless we change things immediately. So who should be in responsible to enforce these changes necessary? Emma, I know you, you want to talk about self-regulation and the industry having the opportunity to regulate itself. I hear you, but I don't think that's enough. I think that's something we can all agree on here. So what more needs to be done? Because what's happening now is not enough. That's yes. something we can all agree. So what next? What more? To get to net zero, yeah, uh, for the FDF is ambitious. So, what are you going to do that's more than what you're doing now? Okay. Well, um, we have just had published in the UK the National uh, Food Strategy, um, the, the 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 NFS, uh, and the government will be publishing a white paper uh, in the the spring, we believe, on this. Now, again, that that follows a forthcoming net zero strategy. So, we're working to have within that. We hope to see 
uh, a full farm to fork uh, sector plan. Uh, and it's really bringing together all the stakeholders across the supply chain to be able to work together to that common goal. And we're doing that um, under the Food and Drink Sector Council in the UK, where we've just established a net zero working group. So we've, we've got, um, you know, the, the basic you know, sort of linchpins in place to be able to, to drive this forward. Uh, and we're at the start. And, yeah, you know, COP26 is, is a great opportunity to build on that momentum. We've got a good start. We need to build on the momentum. Lana, from you, who should be responsible to enforce the changes? Because we cannot go on with business as usual, as you've said numerous times. I think that we need the policy. We need that um, government accountability and uh, regulation there ultimately uh, to make sure that uh, we have the action taking place that needs to take place. Um, and I know that's not as ideal as uh, businesses just doing uh, the eco-friendly thing, but ultimately we don't have uh, time to waste with fake promises. I love that. So thank you very much. I've got a couple of comments that have come in from Qatar um, and I just want to read them because they're they stress all of our collective anxieties when it comes to climate change and especially when it comes to food insecurity. Uh, we have uh, Mohammed. Uh, Mohammed's question is, the issue of food insecurity has been more than prevalent recently. Do you think that moving away from modern, modern effective practices in the food industry, despite being more sustainable, would actually have a negative impact on the issue of insecurity, food insecurity? Uh, and another question here, um, food wastage is a huge problem globally. How would you perhaps go about to help tackle this problem? How could you encourage people from around the world to not waste food when sometimes it happens without people giving a single thought about it? So thank you all uh, from sending in your questions and comments. Uh, it's good to see them. But 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 I just want, I want to give my guests a little moment. We, we've only got moments left on the show. So maybe um, a sentence each. But can you incorporate one more thing into that? What is one thing that we all can do about food waste, about huge corporations kind of doing the, 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 the dirty work of climate change on our behalfs without us knowing, without our consent? What can we all do? One thing that we can do to make that tangible change in our lives. Emma, I'll come to you. Lana and then Mohammed will come to you last. Okay. I mean, from a personal level, I'd say it's about practicing what you preach. Um, so I try to reduce my food waste, hopefully so, to, to zero. You know, I look at, at the car I'm driving, um, the, 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 tra the travel, in, you know, in, in general. Um, it's about what we can do that um, our neighbours, our friends and colleagues uh, can take examples from. Lana? Uh, maybe I'll just focus on one since uh, this has shown to have the largest impact um, individually in terms of climate, and that is uh, shifting to a more plant forward diet where you can. Yes, absolutely. That That's an easy shift, even if it's sort of meat free Mondays or something. Mohammed, what do you make of those bits of advice? I mean, we've heard some agreements, some disagreements, some talking about starting things and others saying we don't have any time to waste just as a as a person of this world what do you make of those answers and do you will you take any of those into your life so i think what they said are probably going to be effective but i don't know if it's suitable for everyone because not everyone might want to do you know a certain type of diet some people have different dietary requirements so it might be a bit personal to everyone so uh, what, about you, though, 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 what about you, though? What about you personally? Me, then personally, then I do aim to kind of have a bit more uh, of, a, of a better diet. But other than that, I try. I aim to reduce my food wastage, especially when I order in restaurants or, or, or things like that. Portions are usually huge, so I try to order less or ask before I order and, you know, try to limit my food wastage in general. It's it's we've got, we have to be all collectively conscious, but hold the right people responsible. Thank you all. And we'll be posting some of the information our guests have mentioned in the comment section. So keep an eye out for there if you want to get involved. Right. 
that is it, folks. That is the end of our show. Thank you so much to Lana Waiganan, to Emma Piercy, and Mohammed Alif Nafar. Thank you so much. Wave goodbye, everyone. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have them. Uh, we will end the show now, um, but we will be back next week with an episode about climate change and migration. I will see you then. Bye.